All right. Well, good morning, everyone. This is JJ Arisha with uh, Prismo Ventures and the National Venture Plan Competition. So far, I've been getting a lot of compliments. I appreciate it for um, all the different webinars that we've been having uh, from David Friedman to Barbara Russell to, uh, to Joe Daniels. Um, everyone really has been uh, uh, very responsive and very complimentary. So we appreciate that very much. That's the purpose of the National Venture Plan Competition is really to uh, provide you with a lot of information on uh, you know, what it takes to really start and grow a business, how to pitch it, how to raise capital, and that's what you're gonna learn from Barbara today. So where we're at in the competition. So the, uh, as of yesterday, midnight, or yeah, midnight yesterday, um, the uh, questionnaires are, um, uh, you know, they're supposed to be in. If you don't have the questionnaire uh, done, um, I'm sorry, you're out of luck and you're gonna be um, uh, not moving into round two. Um, so, um, uh, so some companies did not fill it out. Um, and so, which means that they're not moving into round two and it's uh, really uh, unfortunate that they didn't do so. Um, we will announce the companies that will move into round two by tomorrow or the day after um, at the very latest, so by Friday. So, uh, so be ready um, for Monday, I'm sorry, for Tuesday to pitch for uh, the investors. I think the first panel is the life science. No, I'm sorry, it's um, B2B, um, a panel on Tuesday. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the calendar in front of me right now. So um, so be ready to pitch, five minute pitch, five minute Q&A. We will send emails to everybody who made it, didn't make it, we'll announce it to everybody and we'll announce it to all the investors as well. So they're all able to um, to know of what of the, uh, the next um, events, et cetera. Um, that's it for now. So uh, we have uh, webinars uh, throughout the month of October. So there is uh, one on Friday uh, and then uh, of course, uh, all next week. Um, so please make sure you, you stay on top of this and you come to all the webinars. So Barbara does not need an introduction. She is Barbara Russell and she's going to um, introduce herself and tell us what she's gonna talk about today. Barbara, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, JJ. So, hey, everybody. Um, I am going to talk to you as peers. JJ and I were just talking about the questionnaire that was the, um, the first cut of all of the funneled companies that came into our pitch competition that we're all judging next week. Um, <clears throat> so what I do is I have a company here called CapW, and um, I have two partners that I used to work with on Wall Street. We were all investment bankers, partners, competed against each other. And six years ago, we created CapW, which is a, a boutique investment firm that does investments, and we advise, and we also raise capital as a broker-dealer for early-stage companies, typically women-led or BIPOC-led, because we worked on Wall Street, and we decided it was time to pay back. So it's kind of an interesting, um, you know, we say toilet trained investment bankers going after very early stage companies. So it's been a fun ride. And that's how I got to know JJ because I, um, I judge a lot of pitch competitions and I teach, um, I taught at MIT Sloan. And then for four years, I taught at Babson in the last two years, um, I'm teaching at UMass Lowell to mostly first gen students, which is refreshing and fantastic. So I'm going to try not to be pedantic and talk to, like I talk to my students, I try to, I have a lot of students that are um, at Sloan, they were creating tech enabled businesses, right, that could scale massively. At UMass Lowell, I have everything from uh, kids that want to extend their uncle's painting business to, um, I have uh, a company right now that is a woman who wants to create um, a larger hairdress dressing salon chain. I see everything, a little bit different um, uh, student than I had at Sloan. So I don't have students today, I have peers, which is really kind of fun because I'm gonna share my experiences with you and what I think what makes for a great pitch, right? Which is ultimately how are you gonna raise capital by sinking the hook and making um, our all of us get interested in the first place before we really get into the weeds. So I am going to screen share with you uh, 
Okay. Can everybody see that? Are we all set? All good? Okay, great. All good. Uh, now I just have to, why am I not getting anything? Um, it's frozen. JJ, is there a reason for that? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, so maybe just uh, uh, undo uh, undo the presentation mode and then- Yeah, go I'm just gonna, yeah. yeah, I'm just gonna- Yeah, there you go. Okay, we'll just, let's see. There we go, there we go. Okay, so, you know, there was a, um, I did this, I think two years ago or a year ago to the same cohort. And in the interim, I heard a woman named uh, Zandra Laskowski. I don't know if she's on the call from um, OC, uh, Orange County Angels. And what some of the stuff, I, I tucked in a few of her comments because she did a really good pitch on um, kind of what I do, which is what's the right content, right? How to make sure that if you get one shot in your first pitch to an angel group or VC, what should be in it? The key is to tell a story. And the more sophisticated I got in life and the more hundreds, I think we're deep into tens of thousands of pitches, I think. I know that sounds wild, but we get so many pitches, both collegiately and in our business. And the bottom line is it really comes down to telling a story. It's like when we were in, um, in junior high school and the teacher was absent. What does everybody want? They want a movie. They want to hear a story. They don't really want to hear the teacher, a new teacher go on and on. The key is telling a story, storytelling. Um, so we really um, teach the following. We wanna have two major elements in a pitch, okay? The sizzle and the steak. And what we mean by that is you have to really get all the basic elements of the steak, of the pitch deck right. We say that to our students and I'm, you know, in our daily business, we make sure that that, that pitch deck is scrubbed. It has all of the right elements, elements without getting weighty, where it's interesting. And then we have to work with the founders to make a really compelling pitch, but authentic pitch and one founded in the story. Who are you? Why are you doing this? Tell me what problem you're solving, but tell me in a passionate, authentic, compelling way, right? Don't bore me. Just sink the hook, right? <laughs> So what we do is we create a powerful pitch deck in this story, in, in this pitch, in this presentation. We'll show you all of the key elements, rapid fire succession. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to eat my own, own dog food and try to make it an interesting presentation. And then we're going to show you examples. What were the best and worst examples of pitch decks? And what I do for classes is I write on my, um, my, my um, presentations what stunk and what was good how to get it right, and Q&A at the end, right? So we're not going to make this too long. Okay, how to win a pitch competition. That's what we're really talking about here. As we go through this funnel, there were, I don't know, I don't know how many um, pitches that we got to look at, JJ, but the, the funnel was really large. I think at Rice Business Plan Competition that some of you are involved in, with me, the funnel is massive. So you really have to curate all of these pitch decks before you even get to listen to the founder's pitch. So you have to have all the right stuff in it. And even if you have a crummy business, you should be able to write a good pitch deck that's compelling. And people will figure out that it's crummy or that you're not the right stuff to, to execute on it. But you can get a good pitch deck without having to prove a lot, right? And then effectively communicate it to an audience, okay? So two distinct aspects, as I said, the stake, laying out the critical elements, best practices, how you know, you're gonna, you're gonna show how organized your brain is and how smart you are by creating this stake. And then telling a story and capturing the audience. And you need to do both. Okay, so let's begin. Tell your story, your aha moment, okay? Do it in a riveting way. Keep it short and simple. Kiss, remember kiss? So you think about it as um, a, a tweet. Or if you're sitting at Thanksgiving dinner and someone says, hey, JJ, to JJ, who's uh, 30 years old, had worked at Uber for four years, 
what are you doing? You should be able to tell your aunt or uncle who maybe is not very sophisticated what you're doing and why so that they say, oh, I get it. That's really cool, right? You should be able to say it in simple declarative sentences in a highly understandable format. Okay, so I think all of us know this, but I'm gonna just go through it again because it's really imperative. It's amazing how many companies don't start with what the problem is and saying it clearly, crisply. Why, what, is, what, what, what are you doing and why, right? Well, we, we noticed that we're always standing on a cab in San Francisco, it's 2007. I can't get a cab. And we have this thing called GPS in our phones I think that we're, that's what made us start this business. We got sick of standing in line for dirty, inefficient taxis, okay? Massive problem. Show people getting wet in the rain or make them ideate what it's like to get wet in the rain. Um, are there enough people standing in the rain in San Francisco? Do they have the same problem in New York, in Shanghai, in Paris, right? So you're going to spool out this problem. And then there's enough of them so that it's a, a big, big issue. And then who are you? I always say that, who, who are you? Tell me who you are and why do you think, what, in, in, other than audacity, what gives you the secret sauce, the subject matter expertise to solve this and the grit, right? You're gonna have to prove all those things. Okay, so let's start with our deck before we get into the presentation. So what led you to create the business as we were saying the problem, aha, uh -huh. crisp, clean, and tell me how you're gonna fix it, right? When you tell people um, what the solution is, you really have to, you have to, some people go right to the market, which is, you know, we saw that people are standing on a corner and, and here's, here's the size of the market. We think that it's better to go to the solution because otherwise you're sitting there saying, well, what is it they're going to tell me? What, what do they have? And sometimes you get impatient. So you don't want to kind of tick off the end user, the person with money that's going to fund your business. Okay. All right. So everybody understands the basics of marketing, but it's, in, it's critical that you define the market. And we're gonna to get to this, exactly who are you talking about? I bring up the, the white dude, maybe 32 years old, uh, on Market Street in downtown San Francisco, because now as an investor, I, I say, oh yeah, I can, I can kind of understand who they look like. I wanna know exactly who they look like, because that makes the business come alive. I can see the person with the problem, right? And then we can get a little bit more into the weeds and get a little more sophisticated. Who are you going after originally? I had mentioned San Francisco. I mentioned a dude who's 31, maybe dudettes, but we're gonna start with dudes. What's your specific addressable market? What's your total addressable market, right? So we're gonna to get to all of that because investors are data hungry, not in a deck with tons of data, but enough to sink the hook, right? Okay. So. What I do is um, there is a company that I met. I was a member of a, several angel groups here, Boston Harbor Angels, Hub Angels, and MIT Angels. I'm still a member of two. I won't tell you which two. Um, and one of the companies that pitched us was um, a, a woman that had a company that um, rented toys. It was kind of like rent the runway for toys. I was the only woman in this angel group. And um, I was really interested in what she was doing because I think she was right and I invested in the business that was sold. But here's um, how she presented her business. And I also helped her tweak her, her pitch a little bit. She talked about, we'll call the company Toy Box, which wasn't the name of it. And what she did in a very effective way was to tell us who that person was, right? Instead of the dude standing on the street corner, it was someone else that was the end user of this business. So she took the funnel and told us what these attributes were of the end user as follows. You had to make 100K or more because she was interested in attacking that market first because her monthly box of toys was a little pricey. So she knew that the best beachhead market were people that made at least 100K. Households with at least one kid that, were, that was less, that one kid was less than five years of age. And 
like Uber, she chose four specific SMSAs throughout the United States. And she did a very good job of getting you to make the connection as to what that end user looked like, right? She's 33, she lives in LA and they, and they presented this, which is not dangerous, exactly the right thing to do. And so they, she did call her, she had a name, Lauren. She had a four-year-old boy, Justin. Um, he only plays with Montessori approved toys to make him smarter, better and get into, I don't know, USC or whatever you guys like, UCLA, Stanford. You California people. So <clears throat> the best entrepreneurs can pretty much tell you exactly who their end users are, especially their beachhead end users, because we all know that one of the things that the best VCs look for and the best angels look for is product market fit. It's the holy grail. And we're going to get there in a minute. Um, right. So let's go back to the tour rental company. So we know that she's looking at 100K a year and the, the number of households in the US that have that are 30 million. Of that subsector, 15% of them have one at least one kid that's uh, under five years of age. So there's 15% uh, there's of that cohort, which is 400 million um, households. And of that in her designated SMSAs, there are 450,000, sorry. Okay, so, so if we do a bottoms up, if each of those bought a pr the product at 25 bucks a month, she'd have revenues of 135 million a year. Yes, she, not every single one is going to buy it. So we're going to have to modify that, right? So that's a bottoms up approach. And the sanity check is, does that make sense? So let's think of it in a macro world. Of the to all the money in the United States spent on toys for kids under five, it's $5 billion. 9% is forecasted, this was a couple of years ago, to be in toy rentals, that's $450 million. Um, of that, half of that is in the 100K plus market. So we able to take our funnel and the bottom, the tops down approach gets to $112 million market, which compares, we'll go back, says 135 million, not bad, it's 83% of that. So the two comport. You, you, may, you did a sanity check where the top down, bottom down kind of work together, right? So it makes sense. Again, some of you are old as me, and we all remember those Super Bowl ads with the pets.com guy. Know who your market is. Who are you selling to, right? Remember those ads and how much they spend in their ads? Dumb, stupid. Okay. Product market fit. So we all know that the best investors spend a lot of time making sure this is going to work and that it's already happening, right? The value prop is meeting the right needs, as we just talked about, which we really didn't prove for the toy box business, which is why I kind of foundered a bit. We didn't really clean up on that, but we did okay. Um, okay, competition. So we've defined our we've defined the um, problem. We defined the solution. Um, we haven't really talked much about the product so far, but let's talk about the competition. Um, we're obviously we're going to spend time demoing the product or showing screenshots of it. We're going to get there, but once we do that, which is again, it's an early, it's a a, a twenty page pitch max. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on the product, but it's a solution, right? The solution, a picture, a screenshot of the product. But now, okay, so who's out there, right? We always think about that. When Uber was talking about, oops, when Uber was talking about um, the guy standing on the corner, which we, we're going to get to their original pitch deck shortly, they were only talking about one, maybe two, two competitors, right? One is a yellow cab, cab companies. The other is a radio cab. Okay, and then indirect competitors would be buses, um, BART, right? Bay Area Rapid Transit. And there are other competitors. So that's really the, you've got to scope that out so people understand. And in Uber's case, they did a really good job in their deck. They did a really crappy job overall in their deck, but they really did a good job of talking about it's yellow cabs and it's radio cabs. Okay. so. We've all been at pitches where basically um, 
a company will can't resist and they'll say, you know, we really don't have competition. It's a kiss of death. We all know that. Really not smart. You got to show competition. Uber didn't have competition specifically at that point, but people were getting from point A to point B, maybe not in the most um, efficient way, but they were getting there, right? So you have to lay out who the competition is and what, what's your secret sauce? What do you have that they don't have, right? And why will they choose you and not stay with who's ever out there? And what about like, you know, people talk about um, when you look at Amazon and Google and Facebook and, and Apple, the amount of capital they have where they can elbow out competition that's nipping at their, in their space, that's perspective competition. So we always have to talk about that, right? So I always have everyone start out with, tell me the one or two things that, you, that define who you are. What are your attributes that, you, that, dis, that um, distinguish you from the crowd out there and always put everybody on this attribute map. You got to do it, okay? That's you. Don't, yeah, you just don't want to stick it up there. You always want to wind up there. But when we look at Airbnb in their original deck, they chose two, right? Online and affordable. So vis-a-vis -vis hotels, um, it, it weighed in very well, right? And in terms of online, meaning very convenient, they nailed it, okay? Okay, so we've segmented the market. You know what your end user looks like and you know your competition. You have to figure out how you're gonna market it. How are you gonna get there? How are you gonna tell people you have Uber or Airbnb? Um, so we get to the point of, and I'm not going to get drilling today on this, but CAC, right? How do you acquire a customer? How much does it cost? Once you acquire them, are they going to keep buying your product? You have long-term value. Most good VCs have formulas. Well, I don't, I want an LTV to CAC that's at least six or eight. You know, they lie and say they have 10, which you're not going to have unless you have something that scales massively. So LTV to CAC is critical, right? And how, what is the revenue model? How are you gonna make your money? Next biggie. Um, so once you get, we talked about CAC, once you get the customer in the door, how do you keep the customer and what sales channels are you gonna hit? How do you get traction? How do you get validation? Now these are early stage companies, right? So you already have to convince the the, the guy or the woman with money in their pocket that you already have proof points that this thing works. You got traction, you got product market fit early. You figured out pricing maybe, you have figured out your beachhead market correctly and you've identified the problem and your solution and you're, you're tweaking your solution constantly to make sure it has that, that holy grail product market fit. Okay. And I'm going to end this shortly and just go through the decks. And then I want to have a lot of interaction with you guys, because I already feel like I'm professing and that makes me like crazy. And I don't want to do that because you're most of you are much more powerful and smarter and brighter and made more money than me in, in early stage investing, probably. Um, so the team, who are you and who do you think you are that you're going to attack this problem? And I say that because we see a lot of Talented teams that don't properly put out their attributes and tell you how they're going to solve the problem and how good they were in the past at doing other things, right? Nothing succeeds like success. Tell me who you are and what you've done, right? And tell me how this team is really a team in that there are a group of people with diverse backgrounds and subject matter expertise that are, that are a really good fit to start building. It. Obviously, teams get built out, but the right founders exist that can execute and that have the grit to, to, to forge through it. Yeah, I, I just, there's no, there's no I in team, but I sometimes say, yeah, but there is a me in team, right? And me. Okay, so two founders are more successful than one. We'd like to see founders. We'd like to see a team that's starting, right? Even if there's only one FTE and all the rest are part-time. You want to see the team and that the founders understand that they're going to have to all hustle and then they're going to need a group to get it done. No single rock stars, right? Okay, so when I taught at Babson, 
I've taught a lot of women. Babson um, not only has a great entrepreneurship program, but they have women-focused entrepreneurship programs. They have one thing called WinLab, which are people that have already, some of them have gotten MBAs um, and they, they've stopped their large, their jobs at large companies and they've decided to start their own businesses. And that was really interesting. One of the biggest problems I've found with these women, even ones with MBAs, is that they really don't love building financial models. They don't really like talking the financial talk, right? Um, they're intimidated by it. And my, my undergraduate students are very intimidated by it. And we all see founders that come in and aren't really conversant in projections and Excel spreadsheets. It's a problem. And you really need to get your brain and your arms around it. You have to build a model and you don't need to show a model in your deck because this is all about pitching today, but you have to show that you have a deck and there's underpinnings to what you're going to present and that you understand what your, the KPIs that are going to drive your, your performance and you've identified the right ones, right? Whether it's sales, CAC, um, marketing budgets, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. Stick. Don't, don't, don't focus, be realistic in your projections. Show three years out, simple. And I'll show you on our um, deck analysis, which are the best formats to use, right? Walk the financial talk. I actually taught a whole seminar down in Babson on that. Okay, <clears throat> speak with confidence. Know your, when you wake up in the middle of the night and something's bothering you about your business or you see a pricing different, a strategy change or you're gonna attack a new channel, you should also think about it in terms of your model. How much is it going to cost you? What resources do you have to put into it? To, and how much is it going to cost you? What impact will it have? Will it be in the second year or third year? Okay, so we're gonna we're not going to spend too much time on this. But again, I'm, I've covered most of these, right? And I'm going to everyone's going to have access to this deck. Um, again, LTV, CAC, really important. We're going to get to. MRR, all the other ones it's, it's during, this, um, during this presentation. Sanity checks, make sure it makes sense. You know, don't own 50% of the market in three years. Don't embarrass yourself. Burn rate, churn rate, MRR. Okay, stages. Um, when I'm sure that JJ and his group, when they curated this last funnel of um, companies that are coming in that we're gonna judge next week, Make sure you're saying, you know what, we, we're still, we're early stage or we're, we're already generating revenues. You know, we are post revenue. Tell us who you are. We look at it this way, right? Freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, freshmen, you know, it's an it's a idea in their brain. Sophomores, they have an MVP, um, et cetera. We just be honest, tell me where you are in your, in your evolution. Okay, so walk the financial walk, show the inner workings of your mind and your model. And um, yes, make sure that you um, can talk with authority about everything in your deck, right? Don't, don't skip over it or don't say, you know what? I'm gonna have Joe over here talk about, you just asked me about my CAC and I'm head of marketing. Joe is our financial person. Everybody needs to be on the same page, okay? Okay, so other few other comments on the right pitch deck. Don't use too many bullet points. As um, our friend from OC, OSEA said, OC, always under 20 slides. Big, big mistake is over 20 slides. It just is absolutely unnecessary. You, th you think you're, you have more to say than you actually should be saying. Make it readable. People that have money in their pockets tend to be over 50. They probably are like me, right? They have glasses. Uh, they don't wanna see small fonts. They don't wanna see stuff, with different colors and shades that are gonna make them nuts. Crisp, clean. Okay, and we're gonna to get to the, that in the good, bad and the ugly. Okay, so we've covered this to a fair the well. And this is one of the things um, also that we all should keep in mind, right? How to go up the track, how to go up the pyramid from the idea, you've got people, market, product, business model, execution, getting the money in the door, and how to keep pitching 
iteratively making it better, communicating with your investors, and always having a new refresh deck and getting better at pitching. Otherwise, you're not going to have a business if you can't pitch and raise capital. So that's um, that's those are the key elements. Um, I can stop. Does anyone want to talk about any of the the pedagogy so far before we get into the decks? Any questions? Uh, you can post them in the Q and A section, um, or at, if you want to speak live to Barbara, you can raise your hand, and I'll bring you in. I have one. I have one question. Can I send you my pitch deck? <laughs> of course. Yeah. JJ knows how to get in touch with me. Yeah, you, she's uh, Barbara's going to send the pitch deck, and and then also, uh, as I posted in the chat, um, this is being broadcasted on YouTube, recorded on YouTube, and then the link to the pitch deck will be in the description of YouTube uh, description. So, okay. Any questions so far? I guess not, so uh, we can keep going. I'm gonna ask questions myself, just to make sure everybody's paying attention. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's start with some decks. Here we go again, JJ, stop sharing. I don't know what happened, so maybe uh, stop. Here we the, go, uh, I, I, I accidentally got back. Okay, let's start with Uber, because I keep talking about Uber. Um, it's really interesting to see their deck from 14 years ago, right? Um, it was, they started the business in 2004. About three years later, um, they did this deck where they really had to raise money. They, they were technologists, basically, and I'll, I'll show you why and how that happened. And they called it Uber Cab. You'll see where they were. And let's just do a quick review of the deck, right? So here's their very first pitch deck. Um, we can see that. And I have my scribbles in the right and I apologize, but I'll read them to you. Okay, so let's think about it in the context of what we just discussed, right? What are the key critical salient elements of a good deck? So they're stating a problem and they're gonna tell you who's suffering, right? So they're showing that there's aging and inefficient technology that's interesting. Um, radio dispatch crowned Ford Victorias. So they're saying a couple of things. So the, the, the cabs are not getting two-way communication. So they're just driving around, right, looking. And they're driving gas guzzlers and only get 14 miles per hour. So they're bringing up a couple um, targets, right? And it gets a little confusing because they're bringing up several attributes. Hailing is done by hand or phone. We already talked about that. And now they're introducing, oh, GPS. So there's no GPS coordination. That's interesting. So this is now, oh, sorry, this is 2008. Um, and these cabs are driving around looking in a very old school uh, analog, non-digital way for rides. Okay, so here's another problem. So the first problem, we there were several um, sub problems. Here's another page of problems. Taxi monopolies reduce the quality of service because they're expensive and the drivers are underpaid. Okay, so that's a little fuzzy, fuzzy logic. Medallions are very expensive and drivers only make 31K a year. So there's no accountability. So what they're kind of saying is they're scarce because there's not that many people can pay the half a million dollars we think and drivers don't make that much money and they're not incentivized, I guess, to provide a high quality of service. Now, very subtly in the bottom, they talk in, oh, by the way, we have digital hail. So they even mention a concept in capital, which means they've created a product. So there's kind of a solution on the bottom. And I want everybody to tell me if they think this is a good deck and I'm gonna stop as soon as this deck is over. Okay, baboon, Uber cab concept. So here's the solution, fast and efficient on demand. Very good. Professionals in American cities. So as we had in the toy box company, professionals, they don't want run of the mill people, they want professionals. The convenience of a cab in New York City, experience of your professional chauffeur. Again, high-end focus and another 
another determining uh, metric is they're only going after San Francisco and New York City. And they also are mentioning web and device technology, optimized fleets and incented drivers and net jets going way up market, the net jets of car services, right? So you can see who their end user is, kind of. There's a lot of different things, going, but we know it's very luxe, very high-end service. You must be, a prof must be a member to use the service, again. And you, um, you're not gonna hail these cabs from the street. No way, no, every, not every day, no everyday person's gonna be able to get one of these cars. Um, you're always gonna get picked up, big attribute, right? And you see photos of each other. So now there's another level of intimacy, which is another attribute. Okay, respectable clientele. Again, very fancy. Um, one click hailing, right? So we see all these attributes and lux automobiles, Mercedes sedans, uh, rate your trip, this proved, and high tech solution, geo aware auto dispatch, the holy grail. This is what made Uber, as we all know. Optimized fleet. See, so Uber still believed they would own their cars. Lux, fuel efficient, okay? These are an operating principles. These are attributes, um, customer focused, great user experience, statistically optimized, prepaid. Ah, so there's another big element they sneak in. You don't need to exchange dollars through that yucky, dirty plastic window anymore. Profitable by design. By the way, in, when I wrote this deck last year, in 13 years of operations, they have yet to turn a profit. They lost eight and a half billion on 13 billion in 2019. Um, Ubercab.com. So again, this was 13 years ago. That was kind of a cool thing to say. It's Ubercab. Cab.com was a new concept. Okay, so they're reminding you again, book trips, fleet status, trip history. You can specify locations. Okay. Use cases, so here we have more um, end users. So we're not really doing, we're doing beachhead and then some. So we're saying it's great from restaurants, bars and shows, bars. So that means people don't wanna be drinking as we know that some of us have teenager and 20 something kids. They don't wanna drive and they're gonna have Uber taking back and forth. Kind of like a cab, a little bit more reliable, right? Fast where parking isn't easy. So they're also appealing to people that have cars, people that travel, to go to airports, working while commuting, okay, ride share. Moms, right, dropping kids off at school and elderly, another cohort. Okay, so more attributes, you've gone through all of this, right? Environmental, so they're also telling you that they're green, hybrid, hybrids, Lexus hybrids, et cetera, um, carpooling. And that's the premium fleet. Much better miles per gallon. Initial service area, they're really fine tuning their beachhead market. Technology we know was a really big deal as was the payment, the payment system they used. Demand forecasting, very cool. Very, this isn't clear at all, right? You have to squint and it says, top four players. So they meant, I guess, cab companies really don't know much about that. But they're showing that it's a big market, right? In the US, there was $4.2 billion. It sounds like spent at retail, although we're not exactly sure, but that's what they're saying. And here's all of the market segments in 2007. Target cities, you see their beachhead market. And then they're going to expand their beachhead market to other major cities. And yeah, this is pretty gutsy. Okay, so they're telling you their kind of their their um, scenarios, best case, moderate case, worst case. They 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 in the worst case they they own these ten cars and have a hundred clients, and it would be you know reasonably you know, your downside is it's going to be crappy, but at least it'll you know clunk along, and of course. So you can see 
marketing ideas and et cetera. So they're kind of re redoing everything. And they grow to a three and a half billion dollar industry by 2010. Well, that was an underestimation. They invented a category. And they are, see what they've done at that point. They've, they've gotten, um, they've gotten their, their handle. They've gotten their, um, their um, regist name registration, trademark, couple things. They had 15 clients, patent filed. And they're gonna buy three cars with this round, raise a few million, small office. And now they're worth over a hundred billion dollars. So does anyone have any comments? Do you think it was a good deck? Come on, there's 28 people on this call, two of whom aren't gonna speak unless you and I, JJ, have to ask the, uh, answer the questions. <laughs> Does anyone think it was a, a, a good deck? Would you have invested? So Andre said, no, it was not. Cynthia says, too much type on initial slides. Uh, Kent said, good info, unattractive deck. Patty says, uh, no, but I would take another meeting to learn more. Um, and Sandy says, the deck was just okay, but the concept was great. Yeah, I don't know about the concept really. In general, it, it was hard to get from the deck. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing really was predicated on geopositioning, right? That was yeah. their that was that was their secret sauce. And we, you know, honestly, probably the people that they were pitching to in San Francisco, which were uh, they weren't VCs, they were angels probably weren't that sophisticated about really what geopositioning was. They probably had some, you know, angels less so than VCs don't have subject matter expertise. Most of us are, um, know a, a, a little about a lot. And most of us have one area of subject matter expertise. So you have enough money so you can invest as an angel, right? You did well at something. Um, yeah, yeah. So, right. So m most of them probably didn't know, like, gee, it sounds like an issue. I don't know what this GPS thing. I mean, I know what GPS is. They have a sailboat, but mm, how, how are they going to use that? <laughs> so it was, yeah. it was critical. Right. Anybody else? You shouldn't be. I think I want to hear people's voices. I'm sick of hearing. Oh, yeah, we could, uh, you know, no, I mean, I can bring them in for anybody who wants to talk and, and, and ask questions. Uh, not a compelling story. Um, and then Denise says, uh, uh, too many points to spread um, to spread out seemed a bit like an idea board. And here's Andre wants to talk. How about that? I'll allow okay. Andre to talk. Here we go. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andre. I figured I'd risk it all and say something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, based on something you said earlier about Uber, um, I was looking at the deck from that angle and kind of said to myself, they focused on drivers. And I was wondering if at the heart of it, the, the the riders were the real customers because they're the ones looking for a better experience, et cetera. But I noticed they focused on drivers and also, so I felt the deck was good enough to get the point across that there is a market here, but you know, maybe they could have uh, focused on some other uh, parts of their tech and otherwise as well. So. You're right, Andre, you know, the, in the beginning, as I said, you, you were trying to figure out who they were serving. So the, the, I always say the wet dude standing on, on market street, but there are all of these, it sounds like um, uh, bedraggled, uh, broke cab drivers that had to pay. We know that not all of them were paying half a million. A lot of them were renting medallions. So they were eating out of a, eating away out of 31 grand, which is, I guess, their, their <clears throat> gross pay, which was horrible, right? I mean, even in 2007, mm -hmm. it's horrible to, pay, to take care of a family on 31 grand. So I think they were also trying to save the world, like a lot of good founders, especially on the West Coast in Massachusetts, right? California, we're always trying to save the world here. So I agree with you. They were, they were it's always hard for me um, to figure out what is your goal? Is it to save the world? That's fine. They're trying to save the world. They were trying to save the um, lifestyle to make it a better deal for drivers. And, and they could have cleaner, nicer cars. They could see pictures of who's getting their cabs. They don't have to worry about is someone gonna take off and not pay them, right? So there were a lot of elements going on. They're serving drivers. They're also serving wet, angry people that are waiting for a cab, right? So you're right. So they they could have said that they're, they have a, 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 um, a bicameral focus and, and really fleshed out those two groups in a very sane way. And they were gonna solve two problems. So they kind of threw a lot of 
things up in the air because they were not that sophisticated about that. They probably weren't effective communicating. Okay, good. I'd like to come back so and, through and, that. and mention something on the competition yeah, that you made. So go ahead. I, I was saying I, I could come back after you finish with the Uber. You're thing, breaking up a little bit. Say it again. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Barbara? I'm able I lost you. you. Okay. I'm able to hear him. Yeah, go ahead. What was it, Andre? I was just going to say, I could come back uh, and I wanted to ask, uh, make a comment on what she said about competition. And I thought that was great um, that Uber really didn't have competition per se, but they were smart enough to recognize that they uh, that their people were getting from A to B so that these medallion and that these other companies were competition. We had that similar struggle. So thank you know, I, I thought that was a valid point. And we have to look at ours a, a bit as well, um, because they there's there's companies with technology and companies that make what we make, but they haven't put those two together. So we had to wrestle and come to the understanding that they are competition because they could pivot. So I thought that was a really strong point that you made okay. earlier. Thank you. Right. Good. Okay. Thanks, Andre. Uh -huh. I'm gonna bring in Sandy. Um, so um... go ahead. Great. All right, Sandy, hang on. Go ahead, Sandy. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I was gonna uh, look at it from a little different uh, perspective. First of all, um, sometimes people look at too many details and they don't see the big picture. And the big picture really is that when you provide a platform, you're serving two, two different groups, okay? And so when you look at it, when you look at it in too much detail, you, you don't see the major picture of a platform. So if you have something as a platform, you're providing a method of communication between two different groups and you're serving two different groups. Okay. It's a so really good point. That's a great point. Yeah, Sandy. and so, so for like what I'm doing, I'm providing a, a platform. Okay, so I'm serving one group and I'm serving another group by providing that platform and providing them a mechanism of communicating with each other. And so a lot of the detail that you might normally go into for a product oriented opportunity is really doesn't apply. And really the only thing that really counts is that, damn it, they're providing something that was new and they're just filling a real need and especially if you're in San Francisco and you're talking to investors in San Francisco, they are more sophisticated and they're more tech oriented. They can relate to what they're proposing much easier than people that are in a different environment. So a lot of the stuff in their pitch was unimportant, completely unimportant. Yeah, I agree with you, Sandy. And I think, you know, it was the brave new world, right? Again, Angel investors, albeit in San Francisco, and of course they're much smarter and better than in LA and Boston, right? But, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 I know, but but you yeah. make a good point. It's a platform. It's a platform technology, and exactly. yet they're exactly. serving. But they're but you have to really determine what problem they're solving. They're solving a bunch of problems. So albeit a platform, they still have to articulate what problem they're solving. They're solving a problem where it's really hard to get cabs. The cabs are dirty. No, we, all, and, we, and all, all, no, we all understand that. And right. the people in San Francisco understand that because they live through it. Right. It's easy for them to imagine that. And so all the, a lot of the critique about their uh, pitch is noise. It really doesn't make any difference. The, Sandy, the app, do you know how much they, do you have after looking at that deck, if you paid seven bucks to go from um, Market Street up to uh, Pacific Heights, do you know how much you would have paid on Uber? Can you find that out from the deck? Were they at all price? I, I don't think that, remember, they're addressing a clientele that that wouldn't make any damn difference to. All right, anyone... Uh... Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. That was really good. Anyone else that wants to chime in? Uh, just raise your hand and I'll bring you um, to ask questions. All right, Cynthia's coming in. Um, my, okay. Can you... Hi there. I'm having trouble a little bit. Can you hear me, Barbara? It, it looks like her... Connections unstable. Yeah, it looks like it froze. Yeah, and or unstable. Yeah. So let's um, 
Let's wait a second here for her. Yeah, it looks like okay. We lost her. Back. Come back she's in. Coming back. Here yeah. she is. I'm back. Yeah. There you are. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, some, <laughs> hey, Cindy. Somehow I'm uh, I'm just the connectivity is fading in and out for me. So I'm going to come back. Screen share. All right, go ahead, Cynthia. For me, one of the primary problems is that they didn't tie it together with a compelling story and a hook at the beginning. And, you know, one of the things I hear from investors a lot when I'm watching pitch uh, events is that they, they'll say, oh, they didn't catch my attention until halfway or two thirds of the way through the pitch. <laughs> and yeah. he said, by then I've missed all the important <laughs> information. So moving that compelling uh, hook to the front, I think is really important. You have to get their attention so that then they pay attention to what you're talking about. Otherwise they're scheduling their next meeting in their head and they're not paying attention to the data. Just data itself is not enough. You have to get them emotionally evolved with the what you're talking about. And Barbara, you were doing a great job tying all the emotional things into what you were showing their deck was about, but they didn't do it in the deck. Right, they're technologists. And you're absolutely right, Cynthia. I mean, I think we could spend time, all of us on this call, like what would you have led with? How would you have sunk the hook? Slide one, right? I always think of, like um, Shiva did in the toy company, um, you know, she actually used to have a picture of a mother with toys all over the floor that they don't play with. You have to, like maybe the, the white 33 year old dude soaked on the street corner yeah. about and, tr and watching a dirty, filthy cab go by, right? And splash him with a bottle, <laughs> um, right? I mean, that was exactly what I had in my head, because when I think about what it used to be like to hail a cab, a lot of times you were, you know, you are trying to get something in the rain or terrible weather and, you know, they're just passing you by or somebody else is grabbing your cab, which is another thing that happened a lot. Um, and the idea that you had a dedicated car that was coming just for you, um, that you knew who was going to be driving and shows up in a nice clean car. Yeah, huge huge difference. Right. I, I also, you're absolutely right. And, and, and now we all know we, we have to, we resort to having to take a yellow cab. It's like, oh, right. Cause we're all spoiled <laughs> by Uber. And um, also, so I saw someone in the chat said something. Um, I didn't. Did so Stacy says, I didn't see any info on the founders and their team. And then she followed up by saying, what made them qualified to put this off? Exactly. This off. Great success. Yeah. They didn't have a team. They had nothing in the deck. So, yeah, I mean, so obviously these guys were tech guys. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the first deck for Robin Hood. I have it in a class deck. I don't have it in this, but they were technologists as well. They really were not great uh, marketing people. people yeah. yeah they, they were right. They were, they were technologists and obviously they, they figured it out as they went along. I'm sure you have some really good angels and or VCs or someone in your family that says you can't sell, you can't raise money with this deck. I mean, it's, it's just not, it's not. You know, I always anything. wondered uh, how Twitter's deck was because, um, you know, it was really hard to understand what Twitter was trying to do when they first were coming out. So I, I wonder how their pitch deck looked like. <laughs> yeah. You know what? So I'll run through some decks. I mean, I have TikTok's deck, which, I mean, I couldn't understand. I wouldn't give, have given them a penny because I. it was really, under, you had to be a millennial that was prepared for that app to be launched, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In any exactly. case, right. So moving on. So we all know Coinbase. So this is interesting too. So um, I have Coinbase's uh, original deck. Very few people knew about cryptocurrency and they were already saying how difficult it was to use Bitcoin. And so I'm going to go, I'm just going to show you a quick deck. They raised a lot of money. And again, to, I think Cynthia's point and to Andre's point, there were certain people that listened to the deck and could just wade through all of the clunky parts that were unappealing and get to the meat of the issue. They could see, right. That there was something underneath that had value. It's a hard way to raise money. And you're kind of praying that you're going to have some SMEs, I call them SMEs, subject matter experts 
that are going to hear and go and hear something in the deck that isn't obvious and they'll extract it and invest. But, you know, as we know, most companies fail. I don't know if it's 90%, but it's way up there, right? Okay. So Coinbase deck, this is it. So um, they're making a point, right? They, they saw, they tell you, this is basically a way to streamline the use of Bitcoin. So they're talking about Bitcoin, and again, it's in the in in the infancy of um, of uh, cryptocurrency, and they have this very groovy second slide with light coming out of a globe. Okay, um, and there's no question that Bitcoin grew. If we all knew that it would have grown, we would have waited, and then we all would have put every dollar we had into Bitcoin. Um, this is the marketplace, right? This is who's using Bitcoin, but it's hard to use. So they make the point kind of crowded, clunky. Um, they show that they're using, making a wallet. Somehow they have a layer between the Bitcoin and the end user and, and, that, and that whole list of users. And they compare Coinbase is facilitating Bitcoin like iTunes facilitated MP3. Signups, pretty basic. Traction, kind of, um, you have to kind of squint and figure out what they're saying. Okay, so that was their deck. So when we don't have to come, but I'm just gonna throw some decks up. And you, everybody now, you know, the more I see and the more you guys see, I'm sure a lot of you see deck, you're, you see that there's better ways and more compelling ways. And there's no, there's nothing about team or their model or how they hope to grow. Okay, this was a deal that just closed um, in the great new world of um, ad tech, which obviously is a massively um, uh, scaling um, subsector of, of the early stage tech investments. So these guys are, Ad guys, but they're really technologists. So they're talking about, they're playing on it, the current of um, privacy, right? These global privacy regs where um, people are getting paranoid and rightly so about data, using my data, using our data. USPs, well, not everybody knows what a USP is, but they start that way. And they just wait. You just saw that they raised $40 million. It closed last month, I think. Okay, so contextual AI pillars. We can understand it somewhat, but they're not, you, this is not what your aunt at Thanksgiving dinner is gonna understand. So they're hoping that they're maybe just gonna to go to angel groups that have some subject matter expertise. Okay, so they're telling a good story. Getting a little into the weeds on the right side. Maybe not everybody will understand that. Benchmarks, CTR, we all know what that is, right? VTR, of course, viewability. So it gets, you know, gets, it gets um, siloed quickly into internal jargon, a death knell for early stage companies. Use simple declarative sentences, do not use acronyms, use things that people understand. Right. So they're showing examples, I guess, of who they've, um, who, who their um, early stage or early use cases are in early stage companies. Maybe we're not quite sure about that. Okay, again, it's it's pretty tech laden. Liz. So now we are getting hit with Liz. Liz must be the name of their product, which I figured out. Um, so it's kind of dense, right? It's so we don't know a lot, and that was it. That was their pitch deck. Okay, so uh, I kind of go back to rules to live by: um, text too small to read. Oh, and script. We've all been annoyed beyond belief when founders read every single word on their pitch deck, another kiss of death, show the pitch deck and, and speak to it, but make sure 
Like a TED talk, you've stood up and you've rehearsed your deck where you show the deck, but you speak in words that are exactly what's on the screen. So you enhance the deck with your script, right? And you're giving a TED talk. You're being compelling, you're taking your time. Slow it down, right? All right. Um, yeah, that's just something I give to my students. So we're we already did this. Oh, Airbnb, yeah. Um, again, we we've we've hammered on all these points and make sure you choose the right attributes. This is another example we found um, that I use in my class. This is how you hit the attribute. We've all seen this, the grid analysis of attributes among your key competitors, right? This is a, a pitch of a company called Kufi, not a great name, okay? And you know, most of it is believable, I guess. Um, this is uh, some more pitches and then we'll, we'll go to, um, we're, we're now um, way past the hour mark. This is a company that I just, you know, you can't believe this stuff. This is their pitch deck, two angel groups, um, unreadable, right? And they raise $18 million and they're still in business. This is another one, I'm getting sick just looking at it, all those little things, don't ever do that. And then they raise $140 million. <laughs> um, but I, you know, again, there was a SME or there was someone in the room that knew this and wanted to invest. But the average angel group would have just kind of yawned and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is Airbnb. This is really good, right? Because you just see the build, right? And of course, they're worth 100 plus billion dollars. It's consumable, you can read it. Um, this is another business. We, I hate this. I mean, don't ever put your, your whole set of financials. This is after they close an A, this is what they'll look like, horrible. This is another one that's insane. But Square, obviously, <laughs> Square is, um, came out of uh, COVID pretty nicely. They're doing great. But that was their original pitch deck company called Honey, um, Retail Me Not. Um, I don't want to go get too into the weeds on Honey. These are all examples of, oh yeah, another one. We have an unfair advantage. Don't use that, please. I mean, it, everybody, again, it's kind of like we have competition, but they're really, you don't have to pay attention to them. They're not that good. Um, yeah, complementary skill sets in a team. We love that, right? Engineering versus business. As we said, the Uber guys were clearly engineers, right? And um, you want to see some people that have soft skills versus hard skills. This is another good one. Kleiner Perkins has invested in this. They've gone on um, right out of the box we get a vibe, right? They're using pink, so they want to also attract women, which is my guess. Loan payment, student loan repayment process, okay. Um, student loans are big. Yes, we see they're big. What, what does that have to do with you? Managing student loans is a struggle. Okay, so that's a problem. We kind of know that. Pillar gives people confidence they're paying back. That's not a solution. That's kind of a feel good something. And now we're on the fifth slide and they tell you how they do it, right? Kind of, right? Personal recommendations. So it's an algorithm, right? There's something under, below the surface that is the tech that will allow them to inform the owner of the app to pay off a, a student loan, saves money. Kleiner Perkins obviously liked it. This is before it got really crowded in the space. And they here's they describe their attributes, um, how they make money. We love that. CAC, snapshot, go to market, total. So this is their total addressable market. Team, headshot only, weird. It's like, um, I don't know, in college, your freshman year, everybody had their picture in a book. I don't get it. 
Um, and then they showed that some of them worked places. And that's the end. This is kind of, my students love this because it's, I say it's a, another good example where they raise their seed round at a high valuation. It's cannabis infused um, tonic. And this is a really, it's one of my favorite decks, okay? They raised some money. Um, they wanted to show you that the, pro, that the, uh, the people that um, are, millennials. So I kind of know it's millennials. We haven't gotten there yet. They feel that cannabis product is pretty much too strong. And these are people that are, yes, people that are really into cannabis don't care that they get very high, but then there are two cohorts in between that feel that it's too strong or they're kind of, they don't, they're, they're casual users. And then the curious users, it turns out we're going to find out that that's a large cohort in terms of numbers. And then people that won't use cannabis. And so these, so this, now they go on to show you that there is a big market out there of people that want low dose options. They don't like the idea of using cannabis products. So it's a, it's a very interesting analysis, right? It's very well positioned and, and, um, um, and, and how, they, how they lay it out. Right, so their market also are people that use alcohol, but they don't want hangovers, they drink less. Really a lot of good data and they present it well. And it's about dosage, it's very interesting. Clear, concise, attractive, and it's a beautifully rendered um, product. So you see that the product actually exists. Calories, so there's another attribute besides being able to gauge how high you want to get. They show this vis-a-vis -vis the competition. And then vis-a-vis -vis other um, cannabis, they're okay. So they show you the large market and then cannabis drinks only and where they stand in the market. They've thought about flavors. They figured out how to, they are working on how to market it in some creative ways and have a very interesting billboard, which I assume is real. Um, testimonials, very powerful way to show that you have traction and you also understand your market and you're sophisticated. Really nice presentation of the founders and what they've done and they raise money from a woman that understood marketing. Okay, and the last thing I'll show you is TikTok. So this is what I mentioned before. Uh, in early 2018, most downloaded apps in the world, they, um, this is their original deck. They showed what they have done. They had 3.7 million users. This thing took off like wildfire, like a lot of you know. They in both England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, product. So you see that, gee, what is it? It's videos, still wouldn't understand. It was kind of millennial focused. And then you see that they were pretty sophisticated, but it's vague. I don't know if anyone can, everyone can hear me. Okay, here we go. Um, Tell you a little bit more about their product. So they're not really showing that there's a problem at all, right? Or a solution. There's just something new. It's like if like Uber did just show you that they had something new, that there wasn't a problem. So turns out everything worked out pretty well for them. Um, Oh uh, yeah, and I do have uh, this, we don't have to go through this today, but Postmate was really another great example of a company that um, I never thought that we needed another, you, they, they, their market was they would deliver anything, all of this, anything you wanted, they could deliver it. Turns out that they did pretty well. And I'll, uh, yeah. They did raise, uh, they sold to Uber earlier this year at uh, three times, you know, $2.7 billion. 
So just to wrap up, the sizzle, right? Standing on your feet, no ego. Don't don't ever tell people that you're really smart, that you've saw you've created the next canned beer or sliced bread. Be compelling. Take your time. Watch a lot of TED Talks and see how people communicate in an effective way. Stand on their own two feet and discuss what their business is in an enthusiastic but hard-headed, smart way. Watch the audience. And that's that. I hope um, everybody enjoyed it. I, was, I'm re- I am honored to be here today. I always like to do webinars for JJ. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Barbara is always a star. Thank you so much. Um, all right. It, again, you, you, you're welcome to come on in and uh, ask questions live, um, or you can uh, post your uh, questions here. We have a couple of questions in the question uh, uh, and answer box. Um, can you see that, uh, Barbara, or you want me to read them? Um, in the Q&A, yeah. yeah. Um, could you please, uh, can you find the investors whose background will allow them to appreciate your business? Oh, that's a really good idea. So, you know, even when um, when we invest in a company and we, like, we do, do very, few seed stage, but we will take them to angel groups and either find angel groups that have a specific um, focus, like Tech Coast Angels really likes tech and deep tech, right? There are some uh, angel groups that like consumer, um, some that like fintech. And so you can find thematic angel groups. You can also find family offices if you're really willing to, to dive, you know, and spend time doing research. You can find uh, individual investors and seed groups and certainly venture investors have a much um, more refined um, specialty, right? Thematic invest. And you can look at their portfolio. You can go on Crunchbase. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Another one from Andre. Please really speak on the importance of having a good pitch deck for a startup. That's a message from one of the webinar attendees saying that these examples show that the pitch deck is not that important. Oh, well, no, the pitch deck. Well, you know what? So despite being mediocre, if you have you have an idea as powerful as Uber, it's going to rise to the surface, but not always, right? Don't forget that the first rounds raised usually determine whether or not you're going to make it to the next round, right? You, unless you have a lot of wealthy friends and family. So you're gonna, it has to resonate with someone. I think Uber had such a compelling story that even though their deck was a C minus C, they got funding. You can see some of these decks, I mean, I, I just went through them quickly, but some of these decks, you know, even um, the cannabis beverage company, they had to go to an individual investor that already had a success and she could see the, the benefits and she could, she could ideate how big this could be, right? Not everybody would do that. It was a great deck, but maybe they couldn't find the right investors. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's important. Why not? Why not maximize your chances? Have a great pitch deck and learn how to pitch. How to watch TED Talks. See how people effectively communicate. Yep. Um, Stacy says she could. She could do this all day long. Anything else? <laughs> um, and uh, you know some of the comments are. Thank you, Stacy. I didn't hear you. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to thank Stacy for her comments. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, Andre said that uh, you know they're gonna go tweak few few pages. <laughs> um, <laughs> anybody uh, wants to chime in, jump in, uh, ask questions uh, live, um, or any any more Q and A uh, in the Q and A section, I should say. All right, here's Cynthia coming back in. Here we go. Go ahead, Cynthia. Hi, Barbara. Um, one of the things I noticed is that all the decks that you were presenting are all category kings. They're all people that defined a brand new category. Um, is that the, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of category makers. Um, is that the thing that you're looking for the most when you're looking at a deck is that it's creating a new category and defining that new category? Um, no, I mean, I. I try to find, um, you know, big splashy um, examples, right? 
But no, uh, I, I think, yes, every investor wants to have a disruptive company, right? These are all disruptive companies because that's usually the biggest way to grab share, right? Even if the market hasn't been created like Uber. I think there are a lot of companies that just do it better, faster, cheaper. And they, you know, they, they put a stake in the ground and they, and they, they deliver on it. I, I think those companies are great. Most companies are not category. They're not either category killers or they're not uh, creating new categories. They're just they're just making they're they're going to give you a return. Some you know some angel group said, oh yeah, we'll only invest if we have five x in three years, okay, or twenty x in five years. We some hear people- that a lot. Yeah. Uh, honestly yeah and you know i i yeah you'd want to more and more prevalent i think uh as the message out to startups which is challenging because not every company is going to do that um right and uh, most yeah you're right i think cynthia don't most most investors don't get that return and they'll be happy with a 3x return over two years or three years because it's better than market returns these days so you know, everybody has a view. I think it's whether a, a, um, a product and the founders resonate with you and you believe in them and you believe they can get to where they're saying they're going to go, even if it's only a 3X or 4X return. People say 20X because they have to discount for risk. Right. Right. So if 70% of their, 60% of their portfolio doesn't deliver, that other 40% really has to outperform. But don't you think that kind of... Uh is one of the reasons that so many of the financial projections come in stupid because yeah. startups are trying to show them that they could do that when very likely their company is not going to do that, or at least it's going to take, you know, 10 years to get there. Yeah. I, I there's a, probably a couple of reasons. Some um, they're not realistic and they're smoking their own, you know, they're drinking their own Kool-Aid. I was going to say something else. Um, <laughs> But I think I, I think you got to be, um, you know, again the sanity checks. Like, do I really think I'm going to own thirty percent of the market in three years? I mean, that's embarrassing. I'm going to embarrass myself if I say I'm going to own six percent of a very well defined subset of a market. That gets to be more believable. Okay. And it's better to okay. it's better to explain your results when they've outperformed what your forecast was than if you had to if you're underperforming, right? Yeah, under promise over deliver. Exactly. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Thank you. This this has been very great. Well, I, I, I really enjoy the questions and the participation. All right. Uh, oh, we got we got another hand uh, here. Thanks, Cynthia. Oh, uh, Andre, yeah, you dropped your hand. So, I guess nobody else. So, so we'll. Uh, oh, maybe here he is again. <laughs> All right. Uh, Andre, go ahead. There you go. Sorry about that. I lowered it because you you read it. Uh, Barbara, thank you so much for this. This was really, really informative. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed when looking at pitch decks is that, uh, and many of our clients too, is that uh, entrepreneurs don't really do their market research. And so that you mentioned a really, really good point, which is they, they give you a crazy market uh, that they can attain but they don't really do the research. So when you ask them, so when you're when you're at a pitch competition or you're listening to an entrepreneur speak, uh, one of the big questions that I like asking is, why? Uh, how do you calculate this market? Like, what? How did you define this market? And you bring a really good point. So, do you have any advice for for entrepreneurs how to uh, how to go about this this task? Which because it's very daunting, it's very time consuming as well. No, I think you make a great observation. <clears throat> um, it's critical that founders, before they go out and talk to people and ask for money, which is a serious request, you've done your homework because otherwise you'll get blown out of the water. Any good angel or angel group or uh, family office, high net worth individual is going to challenge you and do their own research and verify, right? Trust, but verify. You really have to you don't want to go after a market unless you really understand it. And you can see in some of the de- decks that we saw, some of those companies really did do homework and you could see it. Obviously it has to make sense to make sure that 
they have properly assessed the market. But it's spending time, you know, usually you can't afford subscriptions to all of these valuable services, you know, like um, uh, whether it's PitchBook or some of the, um, the data resources that charge, you can work around a lot of it. You can find free data. And hours and hours like we do, because we have to, because we need the data. We have to verify. But you're absolutely right. It's critical to make sure you've got your arms around it. Yes, thank you so much for that. All right, thanks, Jonathan. I'm sorry, thanks, and Andre. Um, all right, anyone else? Um, we'll give you one last chance if you would like to uh, ask Barbara a question. Uh, can you mention unrealistic valuations? Uh, Stacy's asking about unrealistic valuations. Yeah, I mean, if you're an angel company, if you're um, a, a, if you're raising uh, angel money, right? You're presuming you're in the seed stage. Um, there, there are real formulas for how much you should ask, right? How far along are you? How much traction do you have? What's the size of the market that you're attacking? You now, if you're, you can find out. And some angel groups won't even talk to you if you're over eight million post money valuation walking in. So you have to think about that long and hard. And there are there are benchmarks and barometers out there that you can find. I mean, the worst thing you can do is have a term sheet praying and hoping you're going to get 20 pre and you don't even have an MVP. I mean, you're going to be laughed out the door. So you really want to do homework and make sure that you understand the market. All right. OK, well, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Barbara. I loved it. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it very much, uh, as usual. And we will see you next week, I'm sure. Yes. Thanks, everybody. All right. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Have a great day, everyone. And uh, we will see you next week. Please be ready. Bye-bye.